Good morning, everyone. If y'all want to open in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6, and I, and I can tell you probably I'll turn that mic down a little bit. I sometimes get loud. If you don't believe that, ask Brother Paul David. It's good to see everybody this morning. It's good to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and study together from the Word of God. I uh, see a lot of familiar faces. I've been here several times, uh, but especially good to see Brother Paul David and his family. We go back many years. Uh, his dad and I started school together in 1986 at Southwest School of Bible Studies. So I've known Paul David since about 1986 and uh, got to watch him grow up and we're certainly excited that he's a part of this congregation. Let's begin with a prayer. Would y'all bow with me? Our God and Father in heaven, Father, we come to you this morning, and Father, we're grateful for every blessing of life, and Father, we're grateful this morning that we can come together as your children, that during this Bible class hour, Father, that we can open up your word and study together. Father, we pray that you will bless our study. We pray, Father, that our hearts will be open to your word, that we'll listen to the words that you have given us, and Father, that we'll apply those lessons. And Father, as we study together this week about spiritual warfare, Father, it's our prayer that, that we will recognize the truth that we are, Father, in a time of war. And uh, help us, Father, to, to recognize that often overlooked fact. And Father, we just pray your blessings upon our study this morning. And Father, we just thank you for loving and caring for us. We thank you for the giving of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we offer this prayer in His name. Let's turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to begin our reading in verse number 10 this morning. And uh, we will, we will, this will kind of be Ephesians chapter 6 is going to be the verse that we're going to go to a lot during this series. So uh, you'll hear Ephesians chapter 6 quite a bit. Uh, that's on purpose. It's not that I have limited knowledge, but we're focusing in on spiritual warfare. And Paul outlines pretty well in Ephesians chapter 6 the fact that we are in a battle. And so in Ephesians 6, in verse number 10, Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Notice what he says in verse number 11, and we'll talk about this in more detail, but I want to I throw these things out for you this morning to get you to thinking about this. Notice that Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. And before we go any further, I want to just talk about the fact that Paul says, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we are to put on the whole armor of God. God is directing us as soldiers in His army that we must take and put on the armor ourselves. I say that because there are a lot in the religious world around us, and sadly there are even some of our own brethren, that act as if God does everything for the Christian, but God told us, you better put on the whole armor of God. And so it's my responsibility as a soldier in the Lord's army to put on, now notice this, the whole armor of God. Again, we'll, we'll give more detail when we talk about this, but it doesn't do us any good, brethren, to put on a part of the armor of God. If we don't put on the whole armor of God, then we're going to be vulnerable to the attacks of the devil. And when we get in and we start talking about our battle gear, uh, we'll talk about that, Lord willing, tomorrow night, and, and we will look at all the different armor that the Roman soldier, and that's who Paul is describing in this text, we'll look at the armor that our soldiers put on and show the likeness to the soldier's of Rome to the soldiers in our military today. But brethren, if you don't put on the whole armor of God, you've left yourself open for the attack of the devil. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles 
of the devil. Now, I'm pretty simple-minded, and, and uh, I'm, I'm a kid at heart, and when I see that word wiles, I think of Wiley Coyote. Y'all remember Wiley Coyote? And you remember the road runner, and you remember all the little tricks that Wiley Coyote had up his sleeve to try to get at the road runner, and, and the thing is, they all failed because the road runner was smarter than Wiley Coyote, and, and the only sad thing is, brethren, that we don't always recognize the tricks of the devil and we fall for some of them but he said that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil he says in verse 12 and this is kind of the theme that we're looking at he says for we wrestle not against flesh and blood I want to say very clearly and we'll repeat this throughout this series brethren our battle is not a physical battle it is a spiritual battle. And we must recognize the difference between a physical battle and a spiritual battle. We'll talk more about that as we progress. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Notice this, but against principalities, against powers, against the ruler of the darkness of this world. Listen to this. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I'm going to pause there. We'll follow later on in our series picking up in verse number 13 <clears throat> but notice just again as an indication he says in verse 13 take unto you notice the responsibility again is my responsibility I've got to put it on but brethren I want to ask a question is there anyone in the audience alive that remembers December 7th, 1941. Okay, we've got, we've got one. That number is getting fewer and fewer every time I ask that question. One person remembers December the 7th, 1941. How many of you know about December the 7th, 1941? All right, so the majority of people, if not everybody, recognizes that date. Just ask yourself the question, what were people in Honolulu doing on December the 6th, 1941? Well, it doesn't take uh, any kind of research to go back and you will find out that everybody was living their life. They were going out, they were dancing, they were doing all kinds of things, they were partying on the beach, they were fishing, they were doing what we do every day, right? They were, they were just going along. And you know what the problem was, brethren? They were at war. They just didn't know it yet because that Japanese fleet had been sailing for a number of weeks to get to Hawaii. So the United States of America was at war. We just didn't know it until December the 7th, 1941, right? What about this date? How many of you remember September 11, 2001? Now we got a lot more people in the audience that remember that day. If I remember correctly, that was a Tuesday morning. And uh, I had preached Sunday as I normally did. I got up and went to work on Monday. Got up and went to work on Tuesday. And our daughter who was in high school at the time was sick. She was at home. And... Uh, about 9.30 in the morning, she called me and she said, Dad, a plane hit the Twin Towers in New York. And I'm like, oh, you know, it was an accident. She said, well, it was a, it was a jet. Uh, it was a big plane. Because in my mind, immediately, I envisioned a small, you know, a little plane running into where you, the pilot did some kind of error or, you know, whatever that was going through my mind. And so, I, you know, I said, well, it was just uh, an accident. Well, you know... 30 minutes later, she calls again. She said, Dad, a, a, another plane hit the second world tower. Well, at that time, I left my office and went to the house, and she and I watched as things unfolded on September the 11th, 2001. You know what? On September the 10th, 2001, what was America doing? We were going about our day just like we do every other Monday. We were getting up. We were getting dressed. We were going to work. We were going to do whatever we had planned to do for that day. And then on September 11th, we woke up to the fact 
Now listen to me, we were already at war. Al-Qaeda had already set their sights on us. They had trained for years. They would already attempted this, what was it, back in 93 when they exploded the bomb under the World Trade Center and it didn't do what they thought it was going to do. And so we were at war, brethren, but we were walking around acting like we weren't. Now here's the point that I'm driving at, brethren, and this is what I want you to understand this morning. So if you get anything out of this lesson this morning, I want you to know this, we are at war right now. We're at war. But ask yourself, do I live my life like I'm at war? Or do we go through everyday life just getting by, working just like they were doing on December the 6th, 1941, just like we were doing September 10th, 2001. We were going through our life and we had no idea that we were at war. Brethren, we are at war. Did you read what Paul said a moment ago in verse number 12 of Ephesians chapter 6? Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Well, what does that tell us? We are in a battle. But brethren, I suggest to you that for the most part, we live our lives as if we're not at war, right? Our oldest son joined the military, I think it was 2005. 2007, he was deployed to Iraq. Uh, 2008, he was deployed again to Iraq. And then in 2010, he was deployed to Afghanistan. And uh, let me tell you, as a parent, those are a lot of sleepless nights. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you may even be veterans and you even know more what I'm talking about. But as a parent with a child, a son who was in uh, attached to uh, Fifth Group Special Forces, so they were in a, they were constantly in battles ever, everywhere they went. So there are a lot of sleepless nights. that we had as a parent. And then on December the 10th, 2010, I got a phone call. I was working outside. If I remember correctly, that was a Friday. So I was working outside. I was actually in the garage working on, a, I think it was a lawnmower. I don't remember exactly what I was doing. And I've got some pictures that I'll show you in just a moment. But I got a call. And it was an unknown number, and if you have children in the military, you know, if you get an unknown number, a lot of times you just don't even answer it. But we answered it because uh, we knew it could be our son calling. So I, I answered the phone, and I could tell by Casey's voice something was wrong. You know, you, you, as a parent, you know your children's voice, and you can tell. He said, Dad, I'm calling y'all to let you know I'm okay. If you hear something, I just want you to know I'm okay. He said, but I, I've been involved with an IED and they're transporting me to, I don't re even remember what the hospital was that they took him to in Afghanistan, but he said, I just want you to know I'm okay. I'm getting on the helicopter, so I'm, he was a satellite phone. He said, I'm getting on the helicopter and I'll call you as soon as I can. So we waited for two days for him to call back. And he told us what had happened. Everybody in the vehicle survived, some of them with horrendous injuries, life-changing, life-altering injuries. Our son was not injured as bad, so he stayed in the military, He's still in the military today. But brethren, let me tell you, that brought home to me the fact that we were at war. And then he got deployed again after he came back, went back to Afghanistan. That was really hard on me as a parent. But brethren, we're at war, and we need to recognize that fact. I, I want to talk about something, brethren, that I believe is vitally important at this point. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 29. I hope you already know what Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29 says, but I want us to read it together because it's going to be important as we go through this study for us to recognize that in this battle that we're fighting, there's some information that God has not revealed to us. 
And I'm going to explain at least as how I understand it. I'm going to explain why God has done what He did. But I want us to know right up front that Deuteronomy 29.29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Now drive down a peg there. We're going to finish the verse. But just notice, God said there are some things that are secret. There are some things that are unrevealed. And only God Himself knows that information. So He says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But now notice this, But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children. He says, listen to this, that we may do all the words of this law. Now, brethren, some of the information that we might like to know about our spiritual warfare is concealed by God. Uh, And I think about why would God do that? And I recognize, brethren, that even in our own military, we have a doctrine that is known as there is a need to know policy. And so what that is, this soldier, this grunt that's fighting on the ground, he doesn't have all the information that the general has, right? Or even, let's break it down, even the information that his captain or whomever it is that's over him, he doesn't know everything that his captain knows. He doesn't know everything that the general knows. He doesn't know everything that our commander-in-chief knows because... He doesn't have to know it to do his job. And brethren, I think that's what God is saying in Deuteronomy 29, 29. For us to do our job, we don't have to know all the intricate details about what's going on in this spiritual warfare, but the things that God did reveal to us, He wants us to know and He wants us to study so that we may do all the words of this law. So brethren, understand that uh, God has hidden certain things from us. This was the picture. I got my screen out of order. This was the, uh, the Humvee that they were driving in. Our son was driving, so he was sitting uh, right here. Uh, this is another view of it, a little bit uh, different view. That used to be where the engine compartment was. There used to be a tire up there. They never found the tire. They don't know where it went, but they found parts of the engine scattered around. Uh, the guy that was sitting in the passenger seat lost both legs and almost lost his arm. And that drove home again to me the point that we are at war whether we know it or not. So brethren, the point that we're making this morning is we are at war. Are you familiar with this picture that's on the screen? Now we're in a Bible class, so tell me what that is. Medal of Honor. I heard somebody say it. It's the Medal of Honor. You know God gives out medals of honor? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going we're to spend the rest of our time uh, looking at God's medal of honor recipients that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11. It is a great and fascinating chapter And it impresses upon us, brethren, the fact that we are at war and that we have been at war since uh, almost the very beginning of uh, God's creation. Now notice this. Hebrews 11, in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now I'm not going to break that verse down and give you all the intricate details of it, but notice this, faith is built upon substance, not upon nothing. Brethren, this notion that that ravaged the church years ago, that our faith is, that they would say, well, the Word of God will get you to this point, but after that, everything's a blind leap in the dark. That's what they said about faith. Well, brethren, I I don't know who originally said this. I think I heard Brother Tommy Moore say it the first time I heard it. He said there's a Greek word for that. It's called hogwash. That's not true, brethren. This notion that the Bible only gets us so far and then everything else is a great leap in the dark is foolishness, brethren. It's garbage. And yet many in our brethren 
of our brotherhood have adopted that mindset. Well, we don't know, but did you notice what he said? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Did you notice that little word, evidence? Think about evidence for just a moment. I want you to think about evidence in this light. We live out in the country. Uh, we live in the big city of New York. New York, Texas, that is. Not New York, the, the Big Apple. We're in the Little Apple. So we're in New York, Texas. And uh, we have uh, some land out there. And I put out a deer feeder. Uh, and uh, sometimes we'll watch. And we won't see any deer down at the deer feeder. But I'll go down there and all the corn's gone and there's deer tracks all around the feeder. Well, what does that tell me? That tells me deer have been there, right? That means that even though I didn't see them with my eye, I know they exist because they left behind the evidence that they were there. Brethren, God has left evidence not only in the Bible, but He's left evidence. Think about Psalm 19. The very universe declares the very handiwork of God. Uh, when you look out at the stars at night, brethren, you know, do you remember what he said in Hebrews chapter 13, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 3, in verse number 4, every house is built by some man. When you walk outside and you see a house, what do you know? That house had a house builder. A house doesn't drop out of the sky. I don't care if it's pre-manufactured, it still doesn't drop out of the sky. Somebody built it, and you might drive by, and there's one set up the next day, and you're like, where in the world did that come from? It just fell out of the sky. No, you know because you've got enough common sense to say, oh, I know what happened. Somebody got them a, a modular home or a pre-manufactured home or something, but you don't think it just fell out of the sky. And so the Hebrew writer says, every house is built by some man. But notice this, he that built all things is God. I know there is a God, brethren, because this universe demands that there is a creator. So don't let anybody tell you we don't, it's just a blind leap in the dark. So he goes on to say in verse 2, For by it, that is by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Notice verse 3, through faith. We understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Do you remember the Bible saying in Genesis chapter 1, God said, and it happened. Light, firmament, whatever it was, sun, moon, stars, God spoke. We, were, we learned from John chapter 1 that the one who was actually speaking is Jesus the Christ. He is the one who actually spoke those words. That's why He is according to John 1 and verse 1, the Word. In the Greek, ha logos. He is the Word. And so, the Word of God, spoken, created the world. And he says, so that things which are seen, brethren, are not made by these things or those things which do appear. Brethren, God made the world from nothing. Just the power of of His Word is able to speak into creation whatever He wants. And He doesn't have to have some kind of uh, uh, matter to start working with to create something. God can speak from nothing and there will be something. And so, I don't have to know, brethren, all the details of how God created everything, but I know He created it. And so the elders understood that. We understand that, but now notice verse 4. By faith, let's, let's ask the question, how do I get faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So brethren, when we read that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, what do I know? Well, I know God told those boys what He wanted them to offer, right? That's the only way that Abel could do it, by faith. And by the way, God is not a respecter of persons, so God didn't whisper to Abel, well, now, Abel, I want you to do it this way. I don't like Cain, so I'm not going to tell him what I said. And so, it, that's not the God of the Bible. God is no respecter of persons. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34 and 35. 
So God told those boys what He wanted. Abel heard what God said, loved God enough to do what God said, and God accepted his gift. Cain, on the other hand, did not love God, did not respect what God said, and the first time, brethren, think about this, the first instance of worship that we have recorded in the Bible, one got it right, one got it wrong. Now, I'm not saying it's going to always be a 50% uh, ratio because we realize it's way more that are getting it wrong right now than are getting it right. But I want us to know, brethren, the first instance of worship, there was worship that was accepted of God and there was worship that was rejected of God. So why are we shocked today when God says some worship is not acceptable? Why are we shocked by that? We should know that. So by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. Now brethren, we are not righteous of our own doing, but we can be righteous. The Bible tells us that. Turn with me to the book of 1 John. Keep your finger in Hebrews 11. And brethren, all of this is leading to our discussion about better understanding spiritual warfare. So turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4. And we want to go down and we want to notice that John says, well, first of all, don't believe every spirit. By the way, that spirit is not a whoo, some kind of ghost floating around. That's a man who's teaching false doctrine or, or teaching. Anybody teaching, he says, brethren, you must try the spirits whether they are of God. But notice this, he tells us, and I want us to get this point, he says in verse number 4, that ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Brethren, when we look at that, we see very clearly that God, through giving us His Word, gives us the victory whereby we are able to overcome the things that the devil has to offer. I want you to notice another verse. I want you to notice 1 John 3 and verse number 7. 1 John 3 and verse number 7. Listen to what John writes. Little children, let no man deceive you. Now watch this. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Brethren, we've got a, a, a mindset among some that say, well, you can't ever be righteous. Well, yeah, you can. Isn't that what John just said? Well, how do I become righteous? By doing what's right. Is that the way it is? Look at the root word of righteous. It's doing what's right. Now flip back to Hebrews chapter 11 and notice again what we just read in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse number 4, where the Bible says that Abel offered by faith a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain. And it goes on to say that in doing this, he obtained witness that he was righteous. How was Abel righteous, brethren? By doing what's right. So if you want to be a recipient of God's medal of honor, it's... it's Pretty simple. Do what's right. Do what's right. Continue on. We've got to hurry. We're running out of time. It says in verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. Now why? Because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. He tells us in verse 6 that without faith it's impossible to please God for he... Uh, by faith, uh, let me read it again, without faith it's impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Listen to verse 7. By faith Noah. Listen to verse 8. By faith Abraham. Listen to what he says in verse number 9 about Abraham. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country. Well, listen to this dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. 
Listen to what it says in verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Are you looking for that city? I hope you are. We'll talk more about that as we progress. Notice that he says in verse number 13 that these all died in faith. They, they didn't see, he says, the promise. But notice this, but having seen them afar off, they, they, brethren, they did what they did with less information than what we have. Now go back to what we talked about, the secret things belong unto God. Why did God reveal certain things and conceal certain things? Well, I don't know all of the answer to that, but I know this. When you're teaching your children, if you've got children or grandchildren, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't have them, you've got parents, and so you'll know what I'm talking about. You don't set down a child when they're two years old and try to explain to them algebra or geometry or, or anything. Do you? Because if you do, you've got a lot smarter kids than I have. Or you're kind of dumb. I don't know which one that would be. But you, you don't because you know... Well, that child, there's no way they're going to grasp these concepts. So, brethren, some things are beyond our understanding. And so God doesn't try to reveal all the details about that. Sometimes, as we grow and mature, then we're able to give information to our children that we couldn't give to them ten years ago because they have matured, that's the reason that the Bible tells us that the Word of God was revealed line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. God was steadily feeding His people the information as humanity grows and matures. God is able to fill in some of the gaps that He couldn't because we weren't able at that point. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, these brethren, even though they didn't have all the information, they, they accepted them, he says. They were persuaded of them. We're in verse 13, Hebrews chapter 11. And notice, and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Now listen to verse 15. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. What is he saying in that? Abraham could have gone back to the era of the Chaldees if he wanted to. Those others could have gone back to their homeland. They had, they had that opportunity, God said. If they wanted to go back, I didn't force them. They had the opportunity to stay or they had the opportunity to go back. It was totally up to them. But what were they doing? They realized there was a better place. There was a place that God had built, and that's the country that they were seeking. And so he says, but now, verse 16, they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, now I love this, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Listen to this. And he that received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Now listen to verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac thy seed shall be called. Now I've, I've got to love verse 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. What does that mean? Well, listen to how he ends that verse. He says, accounting that God was able to raise him up, verse 19, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. I want you to imagine a father being instructed by God that you need to go offer your only begotten son Isaac. And the Bible says in the Genesis account of this, that Abraham got up early in the morning. The human 
natural reaction, I would think, is delay. <laughs> I'm going to put this off. I know I need to get up at 6 o'clock, but I'm, I'm going to sleep in a little bit because I don't want to start this journey. Because, But that's not Abraham, is it? Abraham got up early, saddled his donkey, got everything ready, and they took off. And you remember as they're going, by the way, Isaac was not a little infant. He was not even a child. Most likely he was a teenager, maybe a, living a, a little bit older than that at this point. So he went of his own free will as well. We, we talked about the faith of Abraham. Well, Isaac had a lot of faith too. And you remember as they got there, and this is in Genesis chapter 22, when they get there, uh, Abraham tells the lads that were with him, he says, in East Texas, he says, y'all stay here. The lad and I are going up yonder and worship, and we'll come back. Now think about that. Y'all stay here. The lad and I, that God's told me to kill up on that mountain, the lad and I are going up yonder to worship and we're coming back. Now think about that. The lad that Abraham was commanded to kill on that hill, Mount Moriah by the way, same mountain Jesus died on. Think about that. We're going up yonder and we're going to worship and this boy and I are coming back down. That's faith. And that's what Hebrews 11 is telling us. He says, look guys, I'm going to kill him up yonder, but I'm going to bring him down. He and I are coming back down off that mountain. And so he gets up there. He raises the knife to plunge it into the heart of the child or the young man. And God stays his hand. That's what we just read. And when Abraham raised that knife, he had already put him to death. And he had already seen God re resurrect him. Now how much did Abraham know about the resurrection? <laughs> how much information, did, according to the Bible, do we know at this point, Genesis chapter 22, what do we know about a resurrection? Not much. But Abraham envisioned the resurrection. And so, let's skip down. How much time we got, Larry? It's time, did you say? Five minutes? Less than five minutes? Do I hear ten? Verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months, now notice this, of his parents. I've just got to throw in as an additional comment, we often talk about Moses' mom and she was a great mother, but his dad was right there. He was hid of his parents so dads don't be discouraged because he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the they were not afraid of the king's commandment I've got to skip down to verse 32 and what shall I say more for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon of Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David also, Samuel of the prophets who, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteous. Did you notice that? Subdued kingdoms, we'll talk about that. Wrought righteousness, obtained promise, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Verse 35, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Think about that. Some raised from the dead, but they were still looking for a better resurrection. It tells us there's more to this life than this life. And here is someone who died and God raised him again. And they're like, I, I just want to get that other resurrection. I don't care about this. Give me that better one. He goes on to say, Verse 36, others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed asunder, they were tempted, were slain in, uh, with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute. We've got it bad, don't we? It's just terrible what we're living through right now, right? Well, I don't know what we're, we're going we're to have to bake a cake. I'm not trying to be flippant with that, brethren. But I'm telling you, we need to quit Paul David's daddy 
and I can remember this like it was yesterday. We'd start fussing in class about all the work we're doing. And uh, his dad would say, you've not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. You ever heard that, Paul David? <laughs> you have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin, brethren. We don't have it rough, and yet we act like we do. He goes on to say, they were afflicted, they were tormented, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts, in mountains, in dens, and caves, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They didn't, get it. They didn't even get it yet. God having some better thing for us. Who's the us there? That's Christians. God's got something better for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Brethren, again, I want to go back and we're going to explore this spiritual warfare that we're involved in right now, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're middle-aged, whatever state you find yourself in. If you are a Christian, you are at war. And we need to stop living our lives like it's December the 6th, 1941. And we need to stop living our lives like it's September 10th, 2001. And we need to do what Paul said. We need to put on the whole armor of God. And we need to get geared up for the battle. So we're going to explore in just a few moments this spiritual battle that we are fighting. That's what we've got in store for the worship. And then, Lord willing, this evening we're going to talk about our adversary, the devil. So that's what we've got in store for today. Thank you for your time, your patience, and I just love God's Medal of Honor recipients, Hebrews chapter 11. Thank you all.